I was in a band which was a progressive rock band, which was really weird in those days, you know, very unusual and most odd. And we used to play at the Dugout Club. It actually became so popular that the place was too small. And one of our team went down and, and had a chat with this new place called the Granary. With the Sultans, with the Sultans of Swing. My name's Al Reed, and throughout the Granary days, I was the entertainment manager, the DJ, and the booker of the bands. It was pretty smart because it'd just been done up completely for this jazz club. Racker Bill played there, the Blue Notes played there. But the Granary was a, a beautiful building, and the club was on the first three floors. So you came in on the ground floor, went up to the dance floor level of the club, and then you could go upstairs where the floor had been partly taken away to become a top bar and a balcony. My name's Ed Newsom and I was allegedly the first DJ at the Grand Ring Club in 1968-69. It was all about my youth. I mean, we have to remember it was just after the Summer of Love and all that and Sergeant Pepper and everything. That Woodstock and all that era had just about come to an end. So late 1960s, early 70s was when we, we started down there. So people were already into being a bit more adventurous with music generally. So prog rock was the big thing then. Some of the bands that played there, of course, legendary bands in the early days, just incredible sort of loads of famous bands that played there. And that was down to Al Reed mainly, who had his ear to the ground. One or two contacts in London would ring him up and say, hey Al, you ought to book this band. They're going to be famous, they're, they're really big. And so Al would book them before they became famous. My colleague, Terry came up with a great phrase, it's easier to tell you the people who didn't play there than the ones who did, because it was just all the way through the pog rock era of, of Genesis and Supertramp and Yes and King Crimson, and through the 70s, all the Iron Maiden, Def Leppard. They loved the Granary because it, A, it was a super place to play, Good crowd came in as well, so they were quite happy to come and do their, those kind of gigs, that starting off gigs at the Granary. My name's Bob Loon and uh, I was the licensee manager, late 70s, early 80s. We had uh, all the big bands were there, I can remember Dire Straits being down there. And I think they were like a couple hundred pounds. And I can remember them complaining in their contract. They were allocated a case of beer. They asked me for another case. I said, sorry, only one case was in the contract. And now they're multi-millionaires. When she's walking by the river on the railway line, she can still hear him whisper. Let's go down to the water line. Come on. It was like a big family, really. You know, it, it policed itself. A lot of people thought because it was a heavy metal band, it was a, there was a lot of trouble down there. But very rarely was there any trouble because the place, place had like Hell's Angels in there and uh, they'd be at the bar, sort of stood there, and these young kids would be up there sort of trying, maybe thinking about causing trouble and they'd take one look at the, these big guys and they think, oh, perhaps we won't do it. So very rarely was there any trouble at all there, very rarely. Well, really, the, the rock music was the, the, the basis of it. And we did take on board as the, the late 70s started providing bands that were a bit more new wave. Bands like Bauhaus played the Granary, Billy Idol and uh, Generation X. So, so we were taking those bands on, but uh, it just seemed to start filtering away a little bit. went with the flow so to speak sometimes ahead of the flow but very often it was the music of the day that they would play down there until it became more and more of a rock disco club and then it became sort of stuck in its ways if you like and the rock disco was a sort of legendary friday night or saturday night my name's adrian coleman and i was dj at the granary from 84 to 88. it was unique there was very few if any other rock clubs in bristol and i'm certainly nowhere like the Granary at all, it was certainly a unique place, definitely unique. In my time at the Granary, the bands were falling away a little bit, it started to dwindle a bit. I was doing a rock disco Thursday, Friday and a Saturday night, with the occasional bands mixed in. When In the earlier days, it was a little bit more band orientated, but see, towards the end, they didn't want to put so much bands on because of the money and one thing and another. 
so it was left to me and we all did three nights a week. Yeah, I think part of the problem with the granary was that nobody was prepared to spend money on it. It, it started running down uh, and it needed money spending on it and nobody was prepared to put money into it to sort of get it going again and it just gradually ran downhill and all the toilets and everything were a mess and, and the whole thing was in a bad way and I think it, it's time had come obviously and there are other venues as well coming on in Bristol I mean I like going to the Fleece now for example which is to me is about the nearest to what the granary was like for live music a lot of clubs in Bristol come and go um, a lot of you look at places like Romeo and Juliet they went and Buzz Beers places like that they went and they came back but unfortunately, the granary never came back. The, the council let it out to an agency and they turned it into flats. I, th- I think the club was allowed to deteriorate and it really went down until... It's, it's obviously uh, it's owned by the people of Bristol. And so the council said, look, um, the place is in an awful state. There's no toilets. There's, you know, it's leaking, roof's leaking. And um, they, they actually closed the place. And in the end, the, the council pulled the plug and uh, said that's the end of it. It was derelict for a long time. But in the end, I think a deal was done, and uh, it's now in beautiful condition, and his apartments. So, yeah, I think in the Granary's case, it was a listed building, and they wanted to keep it as a listed building, and they sold it for the flat development. And there's somebody sleeping on the floor where Robert Plant once <laughs> sang a couple of Led Zepp songs, you know. It was the only club that catered for my type of people. We used to go there every week, if not Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and some Sundays. <laughs> You need cooling, baby, I'm not fooling. I'm gonna sit here back to school. Granary is Bristol's home of rock. Granary to me was, first and foremost, the place where I met my wife. <laughs> and you'll find that's true of a lot of people. Made a lot, a lot of friends in a granary. Made a lot of friends and it meant a hell of a lot. When it closes, a very sad day. The granary for me was an era in my life that I was just thoroughly enjoying. It was just fantastic. I miss it in a way, but I met, made a lot of friends down there, a lot of friends. It introduced me to live rock music. I'd been to a few gigs prior to that, but that was where I really, really got into live music and have been ever since. Music-wise, I, it was, it's such a, a rainbow of music. The Granary is, to me, the major rock venue for Bristol, certainly throughout the 70s, and indeed a major rock venue on the club circuit as far as the country's concerned. I just love, love it and love the people that go there. You can't say much further than that.